you really need to know this before buying an EV in Australia if you even want to drive it beyond the city limits just once. The better to avoid extreme disappointment. I'm John Bergen from AutoExpert.com.au Newcast Cheap, Australia only, website, card. A reporter named Belinda Cleary writing for Daily Mail Australia on November the 20th, just a few weeks ago, routinely drives from Sydney to Melbourne in her ageing but serviceable 2011 Toyota Corolla. Hey, it's no limousine, dude, but it gets her there. But she got her hands recently on a brand new Hyundai Ioniq 5 and she had a crack driving La Vida Electrons in the state. Imagine that. What she discovered was actually a pretty stark reality check. Charging en route cost 50% more than petrol for the Corolla, and the 900km trip took 25% longer than in a 12-year-old Corolla. She spent a staggering three and a half hours recharging, driving there and back, and the total cost of 210 bucks to charge that vehicle was a hell of a big step up from the 140 smackers she typically tips down the Corolla's neck in minutes during the same trip. And that's not the worst of it. You won't believe some of the theatrics en route. This is the new Manscaped Performance Package 5.0 Ultra. It's a men's grooming game changer. Mankind swung down out of the trees 200,000 years ago or so, and therefore the statute of limitations on you being unkempt has pretty much expired. The Performance Package 5.0 Ultra is a complete grooming solution made easy. If I can manscape, anyone can. Headlining the package, the Lawn Mower 5.0 Ultra Grooming Powerhouse. Two interchangeable skin-safe blade heads. It's kind of like the future called and said, hey, you're going to be needing this. So you get an upgraded trimmer blade, but you also get this brand new foil blade. The trimmer for broad jungle control and the foil blade to polish things off. That's pretty clever. There's a bigger LED spotlight with warm and cool colour temperatures. It's waterproof, IPX7, so it's completely shower friendly, and that makes cleanup dead easy. And you can recharge by USB-C, up to 60 minutes of runtime per charge, which is rather a lot of grooming. Just two switches, one for the blades and the light switch, which also doubles as a travel lock with a long press. Three blade length combs too, the better to customise any designer stubble you may need. I just asked everyone in your life to get back to me if they prefer to see you with your nose and ear hair out of control. And guess what, dude? None of them has got back to me. Fortuitously, therefore, the Weed Whacker 2.0 is included in the package. It is a compact nose and ear hair eliminator. Also skin safe and IPX7, just like the lawnmower, so totally shower friendly. Two awesome grooming products next, Crop Soother Ball Aftershave Lotion, sensitive skin friendly, alcohol free, fragrance free, and Glacé Cherry on the icing of this grooming cake is Crop Preserver, clear drying, quick absorbing aloe vera based soothing goodness for your dynamic duo. You're also gonna get two free gifts Boxes 2.0 and the Shed 2.0 travel bag. So this is a gift containing a gift with a gift inside. It's kind of like festive season gift inception. The Boxes 2.0 are super boxes. I would wear them to any trouser optional event. No problem. Comfort, style, unique jewel pouch, which is plush and supportive, keeps the twins cool and under control. And the Shed 2.0, it's a grooming go bag of water resistant goodness. I'm seeing Santa and he appears to be doing a home invasion. OMG, it's your home and he's going in via the chimney in the middle of the night. Nobody ever locks the chimney. 
is carrying the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra. Go figure. And you didn't even have to sit on Santa's knee to achieve this. <laughs> That's never dignified beyond a certain age. Ask me how I know. Instead, go to manscaped.com slash autoexpert and use promo code AEJC to get 20% off plus free international shipping at checkout. That's 20% off plus free shipping with promo code AEJC at manscaped.com slash autoexpert. This festive season, your balls will thank you. Up front, let me say that Ms. Cleary has done an excellent job on this story. It's very balanced. She's pointed out the flaws and she's not tried too hard to keep Hyundai sweet. I urge you to read it in full for the context, okay? But it's definitely not an EV hit piece and nor is this video, although I get accused of that a lot. If you're going to buy an EV and you harbour the desire to treat it like a free-range EV, even only a few times by taking it out into the regions, then I'd suggest that the fantasy and the reality of doing this might not line up especially well. You need to know this stuff before you jump off the fence you've been straddling and you slap the big bucks on some car maker's counter. Ms. Cleary is absolutely not a motoring expert, but in my book, she did everything right. She planned the trip in advance. She downloaded the plethora of apps you need for compatibility with the piecemeal charging, let's call it, network, although you have to use that term pretty loosely in the context of charging your EV out in the boonies. This is a laborious process, like just getting set up, okay, for a one-off trip. You need to connect your credit card or Google Pay, etc., to every one of those apps. And it really didn't take that long out there on the road for Ms. Cleary to realise one of the dodgiest things about regional charging. She was just 135 k's out of Sydney, down the Hume, at Sutton Forest. It took me more than 10 minutes to connect to the charger because Vodafone doesn't have reception in the area, meaning I couldn't access the charger's app to get the ball rolling. So not to be sexist at all about this, but we've got a woman on the highway traveling with a five-year-old and a puppy. She doesn't explicitly say she was the only adult party to this drive in the story, but she talks about feeling unsafe and exposed a little later on, so I'm going to assume that that's how she's rolling. And even if not, a woman in this situation could experience this, and I wouldn't want that being someone that I cared about. No network coverage means no ability to connect the car to the charger and flow those much-needed fresh electrons. So, if you're in that situation, how are you going to solve this problem, dude? I ended up getting on the nearby McDonald's Wi-Fi while a kind stranger connected the car at my signal, leaving me to wonder why regional chargers don't have a hotspot. Here, here. Why don't they? Thankfully, the stranger does not appear to have been Ivan Malat's apprentice. But would you be happy with this for your wife and five-year-old travelling on their own? Like, it doesn't seem very secure to me. And if you just dumped 90 grand on your first EV and this was your very first regional charging experience, would you not be getting that sinking feeling? I know I would. I've actually been there. Resorting to hand signals and the kindness of strangers, like, it just doesn't seem like a real technological step forward to me. It just doesn't, dude. Would it really be that hard to have a charger with FPOS? Like, really? Just swipe your friggin' card and charge up the car? Or put in a hotspot? Like, come on. We've got the solutions. It's just the dodgiest deployment ever. And you have to remember that this is not even properly out in the boonies, is it? It's on our most heavily trafficked interstate highway, less than 100 miles from our biggest city in the old money, slightly less than halfway to Australia's capital. Fuck's sake. It's going to be even more redneck paradise on the charging front the closer you get to Dingo Piss Creek, I'd suggest. 
the personal security issue is a real one too, and that's much more serious, potentially. Like, much later that day, 11.38pm in Avenel, north of Seymour in Victoria, she needs another charge, okay? It's 11.38pm, and nobody's ever written a book entitled Things to See and Do in Avenel. If you've ever been there, dude, you're going to know why, right? Ms Cleary, with son and puppy, is hooked up to a charger in Avenel on the cusp of midnight. Not because this seems like fun or a frickin' adventure, it's because she's not going to get there any other way. And it's a dark servo a few minutes to midnight, and she's like totally isolated. After 14 minutes and 26 seconds, I was ready to unplug my ride. Being hooked up to power at a dark service station at that time of night felt unsafe. My gut feeling was validated when three blokes in a banged up Commodore with no plates hooned past, throwing empty bottles into the street. I cannot imagine what it must be like to be a woman with a child and a puppy in that isolated, confronting situation. Pretty scary, I'd suggest. Like, I don't spend all that much of my time imagining being a woman at all, dude. In any context, and this may be a complete character deficiency in the context of the modern world, be the first to admit it. I do know, however, rationally, that it must be very confronting to be isolated like that and a woman with a kid. Like, I don't normally talk about this because it's really not that relevant in the context of engineering and automotive, this and that, but I walked into a dojo for the first time when I was 17. I just got my license, that's how I remember it, okay? And I've never really walked out philosophically. Sort of recreational violence is my therapy. And not in public, not like that. I just let a heavy bag sort of destroy me, suck out my soul and remove the will to live systematically two or three times every week. It's nice. So, I think we can all agree that, thankfully, the dicks in the unregistered dunny door were just bogans who were letting off steam in regional shitsville, because, like, what else is there to do? And, thankfully, they were not muggers or robbers or murderers or rapists or any other flavour of reprehensible societal scumbag. But even if you know a little about fighting and you kind of understand the dynamics of violence... I would argue that it's very confronting indeed being outnumbered suddenly in an unfamiliar place in the dark, in the middle of the night, with nobody else around and in a situation where you can't just drive off, can you? Because the car is friggin' interlocked. You can't drive it away until you stop the charging process and you close the hatch and you're there with someone you love in the car, someone who's ultimately very vulnerable and whom you are morally obliged to protect. That's pretty frickin' confronting. Even if you made friends with violence 40 years ago, it's frickin' confronting, okay? So if things go sideways, it's gonna be kind of an uphill battle. So this kind of situation is not a win, is it, for personal security? Being in this situation, being engineered into this kind of position because of our dipshit charging infrastructure and the fragility of support in the regions. It opens a door that I would not want any of my loved ones to be freaking standing in. I don't want to be standing in that kind of situation. I'll just leave my interaction with violence for the punching bag for the rest of my freaking life and be very happy with it, frankly. Pro tip, okay? Australian law specifically prohibits you from carrying anything for self-defence. So force multipliers are out. They are totally illegal. And that is a stroke of total freaking genius, is it not? Like, when I mention it to them, Americans just shake their freaking heads when they hear this. And I get it, dude. The deck is stacked against you here if you are the good guy. Anyway... Ms. Cleary also points out that the gloss comes off the EV regional user experience essentially as soon as you hit the open road. The futuristic looking mid-sized hatchback boasts a 500 kilometre mileage per charge, but I quickly learned this is best case scenario and the most I got was 330 kilometres 
and by then the car's dash was lighting up to let me know I was quickly approaching powerlessness. And that's an important something else that you need to know if you transition to an EV after living a life of driving internal combustion. With internal combustion, remaining range increases when you hit the highway because loping along at 100 is the most efficient mode of operation for combustion. The reverse is actually true of EVs. They are most efficient in city traffic and at their least efficient out on the open road. So you might leave home and see 300 kilometres remaining or something while you're driving up your street in an EV, but as soon as you hit the freeway, it's going to plummet to the low 200s, dude. You can take that to the friggin' bank. So if you plan a trip using the manufacturer's purported range, or even the range that you see on the trip computer in town routinely after a full charge, range anxiety is going to consume you. There are two other things that perhaps you really should consider. Having to stop for 40 minutes every three hours simply drags out road trips. Ms. Cleary spent three and a half hours recharging on a return trip that typically would be 18 hours of total driving, like nine there and nine back. Let's say we take 30 minutes off the three and a half to balance up refueling a petrol car and stopping occasionally for like a coffee and a pee or something. This extends the drive time by 20-ish percent. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like driving to Melbourne. It's not something I would do just for shits and giggles, dude. It's, it's not even really driving. It's listening to podcasts at 100 k's an hour, which is fairly boring after the first one or two podcasts. I want that drive to end as quickly as possible. Therefore, adding substantially to the total time is the absolute shits and it amps up your exposure to fatigue because charging is not a break. It's a total will to live sapping waste of time that means you take 11 hours to finish a job that should be completed in nine. While I didn't have any problems with faulty charges, if one on your route was broken, it could also spell disaster as the next option is usually a little too far away. And that's the real elephant in the room of regional EV travel. Even on Australia's most heavily trafficked highway, there is insufficient redundancy in the charging infrastructure to ensure that you get to the other end reliably. Like one failure and you are gonna be sidelined. That's freaking unacceptable. I guess the fallback position there is, if you need a solution, just Book a room in some local flea bag motel and run an extension cord to the car from your body fluid stained room. And enjoy your stay, dude. Pro tip, a flat Ionic 5 is going to take like 30 hours to charge fully using a conventional Australian PowerPoint. But you can probably get to the next hopefully functional charger in just 15 hours of charging. Now, people always tell me that I'm an EV hater, and I am emphatically not. There is absolutely a usage case for EVs. But very few car makers are selling the kinds of EVs we really need to make a real difference to, for example, urban air quality. I'm a pragmatist who respects the facts and doesn't buy into the quasi-religious EV zealotry, which is parroting itself nauseatingly, all over the world. Ms. Cleary outlines independently and reliably exactly what you can expect if you buy an EV and you want to drive it into the regions. If you just want to drive from Wallara or something to the CBD, then great, dude. But even that is still not as green as simply catching the bus with the rest of ambient humanity. It's just not. Dispute me on the facts if you want. Tell me which bit of this assessment is factually incorrect, but kindly do not give me any of this can't make an omelette without breaking the eggs bullshit, dude. Like, don't bother. That proposition is toast. It's like the spoon in the matrix. There is no fucking EV omelette. <laughs>